oftentimes when the topic of evangelism is discussed, it's discussed in the sense of a formal plan that the church has organized. And people debate which, which method and which strategy or ideology is the best way to carry out evangelism. But I would like to suggest that the Bible teaches that there is simply a natural process of evangelism that occurs in the life of those who truly come to know Jesus as Savior. We've been studying the Gospel of John, and this morning I'd like to continue that study as we look at chapter 1, verses 35 and following. John chapter 1, verses 35 and following. Here we see the beginnings, the beginnings of evangelism. And by evangelism, I mean bringing people to Christ, helping sinners to find salvation through the Messiah. John chapter 1, verse 35 says, The next day John was there again. I mean, that's important to understand the, the, the chronology of what's happening as John's gospel, again, is slightly different. When I say different, I don't mean wrong, I don't mean deceitful or that it contains error, but it's different than the three synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke in that it contains a lot of new information, different information. The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the, dis when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent the day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Father in heaven, as we continue to study the Gospel of John and as we look at this passage that, that you've recorded in the pages of Scripture for us, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us again to understand it as you wanted it to be understood and that we would apply it to our lives, that we might be doers of the word and not hearers only. And Father, just continue to work in us, continue to shape us, continue to, to sand away those rough edges and to mold us and to make us into the type of people that you want us to be. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in uh, John chapter 1, you'll note that he starts, John starts by saying the next day. The next day being the, apparently the day after he gives testimony to what he saw at the baptism of Jesus. Now if you've been here as we've been studying the Gospel of John, you'll note that for the last four weeks or so as we started from John chapter 1 verse 1 all the way up into the current text that we're reading this morning, we've seen that, that John is establishing, verifying, and proving the deity of Jesus Christ. Over and over again, he drives home the point that this Jesus was more than a man, more than a prophet, more than just a good person. He was the Christ, the Messiah. 
And when we get to this point in time, what we have to understand is that when John gives testimony in the previous verses, in verses 29 and following, up to verse, the end of verse 34, he's not actually doing the baptism of Jesus at this point in time. He's making reference to the baptism of Jesus at this time. And I say that because some people question the chronology of the Gospel of John. As they read it, it says in verse 35 again, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And then it, it, it talks about them going to his, where he was staying, and they stayed with him there for the day, and then they apparently returned back to their jobs and to what they were doing. Well, people begin to think about the other Gospels in comparison to the Gospel of John and what it says here, and they say, wait a second. Uh, he just talked about, behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world, or look, behold the Lamb, as he says here in this verse. He's just made reference to the baptism of Jesus. I thought after Jesus was baptized, he was carried away by the Spirit into the wilderness. Isn't that what you remember, that Jesus got baptized and then immediately went into the wilderness for 40 days and where he was tempted of the devil. And you remember those three temptations where the devil comes to Jesus and, and tempts him and Jesus overcomes those temptations and then at the end of the 40 days he's so weak he's ministered to by angels. And, and so we look at the Matthew, Mark, and Luke and we compare that with John and we say, well, these, something seems wrong here. This says the next day John was there again with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by. What we don't recognize is that sometimes we confuse that the, the testimony of John about the baptism of Jesus with the actual baptism. And again, I'd, li I'd like to just simply mention as you read through this, as you read through it carefully, you'll note that, that John wasn't actually doing the baptism earlier in the passage we, passages we've already studied, but that instead he's making reference to the baptism. What we read about here in John chapter 1, verse 35, when it says the next day, is apparently after Jesus had come back from the wilderness, he's back in the area where John the Baptist is baptizing people. And that's when John the Baptist says again that uh, as Jesus passes by, and that's why I think John adds the little note there, and we miss that sometimes. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples, and so John's baptizing again. He's baptizing people, and Jesus comes back to that same vicinity. John sees him, and he says again, look, the Lamb of God. Apparently, what Jesus is doing is he's going back to that vicinity to begin to elect or choose some of his disciples. Uh, why did he choose disciples of John? I don't know. We, don't, we, we can guess, but it never actually tells us. But those apparently are some of the first two disciples that he chooses as revealed in this particular passage. Now we know, and Jesus of course knew, that before long John is going to be thrown into prison. He's going to be put into prison, and his ministry is going to end there. Because you remember um, one of the, the, the dances that one of the girls does before the ruler there of the day, and um, she asks for his head on the platter, and John the Baptist is decapitated, and that's the end of his life. And, and, so he, and also you remember that John said, I must decrease and he must increase. John knew that Jesus was more significant than him by far. He said, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. He knew that, that people should be following Jesus and not him. And Jesus knew that. And so Jesus goes back to this vicinity and begins to choose some of his disciples from the disciples of John. And so that helps to explain the chronology because some people end up thinking that there's some sort of mistake in the, in the Bible, that there's some sort of conflict or contradiction between what John 1 says and what some of the other synoptic gospels say about the chronology of the baptism, the wilderness temptation, and the choosing of disciples. There is no mistake. What we have to realize is Jesus was baptized, went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, comes out of the wilderness, and then what's he do? He goes back to where John the Baptist is baptizing. John sees him again, refers to him as the Lamb of God. Two of his disciples, verse 37, hear him refer to him as the, 
the Lamb of God. They had probably seen him before. They probably had heard some of what John may have said about him before. They may have even heard the voice of God at the baptism of Jesus when God said, this is my beloved son and gives his stamp of approval by sending the Holy Spirit to descend upon him, which is the sign that John the Baptist refers to earlier in this text. And, and so they follow. They follow Jesus. They begin to realize, hey, John's pointing us to this guy. Not to himself. He's pointing us to this guy. And so the disciples say, uh, they, when they heard this, they, they went and they followed Jesus and they said, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he says, come, he replied, and you will see. And so they follow Jesus and they spend the day with him. And that helps us to understand the chronology here. And for some reason, John wants us to know the chronology of the first couple of days of his choosing of disciples because in verse 35 he says the next day verse 43 he says the next day and then verse 1 of chapter 2 he says on the third day and so he makes it clear okay here's day one here's day two here's day three after that in the gospel of John it simply says then this happened or after that this happened he no longer keeps track of the chronology he only keeps track of these first three days for some reason. Why? I'm not certain, and most commentators don't deal with it. They just note that he does. It may be that for some reason, in the Apostle John's mind, this is a very significant uh, point in time because one of the disciples that follows Jesus, and you'll notice he doesn't identify both of them here in this chapter, but one of the disciples that followed Jesus, most people believe, is the Gospel writer, John. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 43, that's where you'll find the, 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 um, the event of Jesus being taken off or, or by the Spirit or being led, not taken by the Spirit, but being led by the Spirit uh, into the wilderness. And then the, right after that, you'll find in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, where John the Baptist has been put in prison. And so even when you look at the Gospel of Matthew and compare it with what we read in the Gospel of John, what you'll begin to realize is that the Gospel of Matthew, as do the other Gospels, have gaps in them where things happen. We know things. There's periods of time that elapse where we know nothing about that period of time if one of the other Gospel writers or some other place in Scripture doesn't make reference to that. And from that time on, that's when Jesus, if you, if you look at Matthew 4.12, or you can just write it down, that's when Jesus began to preach, apparently, and where he also, again, begins to call some of his disciples. It says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, so Matthew 4.12 makes a big jump from the baptism of Jesus to, G, to John being in prison. Yeah, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and he lived in Capernaum. So Jesus now goes to live in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun. This is northern Israel up by the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Galilee, Lake Knesset as it's called, or, or the Sea of Galilee, uh, to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Then it goes on and it says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Now here you'll note that when he calls Peter, uh, uh, here in this particular passage, when it says he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, we've got two different people because he doesn't identify, and I say we have two different people because in this, the other story here, the other disciple that is unnamed, I believe to be John, the gospel writer, but you have two brothers this time in Matthew chapter 18 that hear the call to follow, and it says that they were fishing. They were casting their net into the lake. So they were either on the seashore fishing or they were just a little ways off of the shore fishing from their boat. And Jesus extends a call to him. Yet in John, we don't see the two people that we read about fishing. 
Apparently, they're standing there where John is baptizing, which isn't the Sea of Galilee, but is in the Jordan River. And so we have different calls to follow. One of the things we miss in the Scripture is that Jesus apparently called people to follow him on multiple occasions. And it wasn't the very first call where he calls the disciples, where they left everything on sort of a semi-permanent basis. And I say semi-permanent because there were times apparently when the disciples went home to their families, where they went home to do a little work and make a little bit more money. And then they went on Jesus with some of his other missionary journeys. But John seems to record a different call to follow than what Matthew records. And in John, it seems like the other disciple that's not named, when it says the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus, turning around, he saw them, and he goes on, he said, they asked where he, could, where he stayed, and they told him. And then verse 40 says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. So it identifies Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. But it doesn't identify the other one who followed, which, by the way, is an unusual for the Gospel of John. That's the way that John seems to write. Um, he, he mentions himself either in the third person. And let's see, let me get to this. He either mentions himself in the third person or he refers to himself by what he was known by by the other disciples. For example, later on in the Gospel of John in chapter 13, verse 23, it says one of them, now this is John writing in his Gospel, he says one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now let me ask you a question. Who was the disciple that Jesus loved? John. So John is writing about himself here, but he doesn't identify himself as I was reclining next to him. He, he identifies himself sort of in the third person. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to the disciple and said, ask him what, uh, which one he means. Then again in John chapter 19, verse 26 through 27, we see another example where John doesn't identify himself directly. Verse 26 says, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Who was that disciple? John. Well, we know that from the other Gospels, that it was John. So John, for some reason, in his Gospel, writes this way. And it appears that it's him and Peter who are called in the Gospel of John, where in Matthew's Gospel, at that particular call, where they're fishing and not standing by where the baptism of John is taking place, we have a different call, this time to Peter and his brother. And so there are various calls. I say all of that so that we would understand that there are various calls in the Scripture to follow Jesus. People didn't immediately follow Jesus full-time. You know, we, we get this impression that Jesus said to these strangers as he walks by, and, and that's the way it almost seems to read. As you read John here, John's walking by, John, and the, John, the, or, um, excuse me, Jesus is walking by, and John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God. And, you know, the guys are standing there, and two of them just drop everything and decide to follow Jesus. Now, the, the indication in the Scripture is, is that they've probably heard Jesus speak before. They've seen the baptism of Jesus. They were, they were probably there when the dove descended upon Jesus. They probably heard John's testimony regarding Jesus. And so you have this call, apparently one of the earlier calls in the Gospel of John. You have Matthew's call, which is a little bit later. This call, he calls them the to come and follow him, but they, they apparently only follow him on a momentary or a temporary basis. And, and when I say that, it's not just uh, Simon, Peter, and John that follow him. He also, it says in verse 43, it says the next day, so the day after this first day, that day two in John's chronology, in verse 43, it says the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about. And so he extends another call to these individuals. Again, different than some of the other calls that we see in the other Gospels. These were ordinary people going about their business, but interested in what John the Baptist was preaching about. 
and had become disciples of John the Baptist. That doesn't mean that they had left their homes to follow John the Baptist full time. Doesn't mean that they were with him 24 hours of a day. To be a disciple means to be a learner. It, it, like we are disciples of Christ. It doesn't mean that they had given up their everything in their daily lives, dropped everything, their jobs and everything else, to follow Jesus or to follow John the Baptist 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. And they didn't go by a solar calendar. They went by a lunar calendar. So, it wouldn't be, so 360 days a year. It took a while before these men actually left their occupations to follow Jesus. We, we get the wrong picture sometimes of disciples. We forget that they had families. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 3 through 6, it says, This is my defense, the Apostle Paul writing this, To those who sit in judgment on me, don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas. Now, there was some question about the support of the apostle Paul. And you remember Paul oftentimes worked to support himself rather than taking money from other Christians and other bodies of believers. And he did that basically because he didn't want to be accused of them, of, of preaching for the wrong reasons. But he did take money from some whom he knew would not accuse him of preaching for the wrong reasons. And so here he makes his defense to those at Corinth and says, hey, don't we have the right to do these things? And I, when I'm talking to you about support, and he doesn't even have a wife, the other apostles are traveling on their missionary journeys with their believing wives. The Lord's brothers are traveling on their missionary journeys, apparently with their wives, and Peter, Cephas, is traveling with his wife. And so they, they get even more support than Paul does, yet they were criticizing Paul. And, and so he's just, what we learn from that is that the, the, the saints were normal people. The disciples, I should say, were normal people. We, we get the wrong picture of them sometimes. I want to show you a little, you know, we, this, this contributes to that. Uh, we see paintings. You know, here's, here's the um, disciple Mark. And uh, this happens to be, I believe, a Russian Orthodox um, you know, painting of, of uh, the disciple Mark, one of the gospel writers. And he, we see him with a halo around his head and he's holding something. And there's this saintly pose, as if these, this was the way that these men actually were. I'd like to suggest that this painting is a little more realistic. <laughs> and you can't see this very well, can you, from where you're at? But here we have St. Thomas with his finger sticking into the body of Jesus Christ. And what you can't see very well either is that these are sort of rough-looking individuals. A bearded weather. You can see the tear on the, on the shoulder of this guy's garment. Remember, the first they're poor fishermen. Most of the early believers were from the lower classes of society. They were slaves. They were, they were the common people of the day. They were, they were people that oftentimes, many of them were, were, were prisoners. Um, and, and so they, were, they weren't the elite. They weren't the upper crust of society that came after Jesus. And, and we've, we fail to recognize that sometimes. These were people that had doubts. These were people that, that wondered. These were people when they followed Jesus, they're following him in part out of curiosity. Hey, where are you staying? We want to come and talk with you a little bit. You know, John's saying you're the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But it's not that they believed on him immediately. In fact, we find that they don't believe on him. And there's various debate and discussion as to when the disciples actually come to faith but in in chapter 2 what we'll see later on as we get near to into chapter 2 there's a verse in chapter 2 where it says that they believed on him after they had seen um, the one of the first miracles that he did and so even at this point in time they don't as they're following Jesus they don't understand all of who Jesus is. They just know that he's more significant than John. They don't know all of what Jesus can do. They haven't seen any of his miracles as of yet because John's very careful to tell us on the third day at the wedding, and his disciples are there at the wedding of Canaan, that's the first miracle, and we'll see that in the future. That's the very first miracle that Jesus does. So as of this point in time, these men haven't seen Jesus do any miracles. So they're average peoples investigating Jesus. But they know there's something special about them. They don't know all of what they'll find out, but they know that there's something special. 
And in the process of knowing that and understanding what John meant when he said, Behold the Lamb of God, although I don't think they understood it in its fullness because they, they obviously didn't understand certain details of it, but in understanding what they did understand, what we find them doing is going and getting their family members and bringing them to Christ. In verse 40, verse 40 says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and he had followed Jesus and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon. So, again, Andrew's brother is Peter. Simon is Peter. Um, that's the name that Jesus gives to him. But it's not the other disciple who followed Jesus that we've been talking about. That was John. John and Andrew followed Jesus Andrew realizes they spend a day with him at, it, where the, at the place I was going to say his home, but it, it's not his home. It's somewhere where he's staying. It's somebody else's home, apparently. And they stay with him quite late, depending on how they were figuring time. It says in, uh, up to the 10th hour here in verse 39, there were two ways of calculating time in New Testament days. There was the Roman way and there was the Jewish way. And uh, it, there's debate as to how they were calculating time, but the indication is they spent the day with him. They spent quite a bit of time. At the end of the day, Andrew's excited about what he had learned, and he goes and he gets his brother. And he tells his brother, we have found the Messiah. See, in end of verse 41, we have found the Messiah. And then John, the gospel writer, adds the parentheses, that is the Christ. And then the same thing happens with Philip and Nathaniel. In verse 43, it says, the next day Jesus decided... To leave for Galilee and finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. And Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law. And so as uh, Andrew, as, uh, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, follows Jesus, immediately after learning more of what he learns about Jesus, what's the first thing he does? He goes and he gets his brother Nathanael. And he tells them, we have found Moses, the one that, or we have found the Messiah, the one that Moses wrote about. And so both of these individuals go, Andrew and Nathaniel or Philip, both of them go and get their brothers and tell them, hey, we've found the one that we've been looking for. We found the Messiah. That's how we see evangelism happening. People who discover Jesus, if you will, and I say discover, are introduced to Jesus, in this case by John the Baptist, or by a brother or someone else. Uh, they, they find out about Jesus, they learn more about Jesus, they get excited about Jesus, and they go tell someone else about Jesus. That's it. It's as simple as that. There's no organized strategy through most of the Gospels. In the book of Acts, we do find Paul, he goes out on missionary journeys. We don't know how organized they were. We know he decides to go to certain cities to preach the gospel. We know the church gives their consent. Sometimes the church says, hey, we're going to send Barnabas with you or we're going to send somebody else with you. But the, the bottom line is, in the beginning, the only plan of evangelism wasn't really a plan. It was just, hey, this guy's something else. We found the Christ. We found the Messiah. And they go and tell somebody else. Once we understand who Jesus is, that He's the Savior, He's the Messiah, in, in this case, there were probably some other motives. Uh, you know, they, I don't know that they understood that Jesus was going to die for their sins. I think they were looking forward to freedom from oppression, freedom from the tyranny of Rome. These people lived in a different day and age and in, a, in a, a, a place where they were probably constantly afraid of Roman authorities. You know, they're, they're a minority population, I guess you'd say. They're a, they're a conquered population living under the rule and reign of, of a nation that enforced the law. And in those days, these people weren't your friends. The authorities weren't your friends. And, and so... Now, here's the Christ. They're looking for the Christ, the Messiah. But they're not looking for a Savior who's going to die on the cross for them. They're looking for a Savior who's going to deliver them from the, the tyranny and the oppression and the rule of ancient Rome. But they're excited about that. And we don't, we don't know, uh, for us, we don't have that type of situation where we look at Jesus as somebody who's going to, although ultimately he will, free us from the the injustice and, and all of the things that happen in this world that aren't right. 
Ultimately, that will come about as well as he establishes his millennial kingdom and we'll get to rule in a, or to live in a place and possibly rule and reign with the Messiah. We'll get to live in a place, though, where there is perfect justice, where things happen the way that they're supposed to happen, and where there's no longer the, the problems that we experience in our culture today. But ultimately, we look at Jesus as, as not the one who will deliver us from political oppression, but the one who will deliver us from the penalty of our sins. And we should have just as much joy about finding Jesus as Andrew had. We should have just as much joy in finding Jesus as Philip had. And as, as we understand who Jesus is, then we, that joy translates itself into telling others. When we really know who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, it's hard to not tell people about him. And that's basically how evangelism occurs. And we see this even in the beginning of the book of Acts. Flip over for a second just to Acts chapter 8. And we sometimes miss the significance of what's happening here in Acts chapter 8 and throughout really throughout the life of the early church and throughout much of the church today. My wife was listening. I fell asleep during it, but last night was listening to the testimony of two, um, I want to say Iranians, but I guess it's, uh, uh, well, I'll call them Iranians. I, I think they say it a little different than that. Two Iranian ladies that were in jail for over 200 days in Iran because of their Christian faith. And uh, I don't know if you've seen it. There's a YouTube video on these two ladies. They're two, two young um, ladies and they give testimony to, to why they were in prison. And it's about an hour long YouTube video. It's done by Voice of the Martyrs and they, they talk about their, their imprisonment. And so there are places today that maybe identify a little better with what's happening in chapter, uh, chapter 8 of Acts than what we do today. Although I think America is coming closer and closer to that point where the church will be persecuted someday. There's already some social stigma to being a Christian if you're a believer in Christ. There's already um, some ideological differences that are becoming more and more manifest that will, I think, begin to cause problems for the church. But we're not at the point like they were here in Acts chapter 8 or like what we see in other countries where because of the practice of their faith they end up being arrested or persecuted. But note what it says in chapter 8, verse 1. It says, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. That is the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And note this, and all, all except the apostles were scattered. Now, we've mentioned this before. All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. They didn't run. The others ran. Verse 2, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. Verse 3, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered. Now the question is, who are those who had been scattered? They're all of the believers. They're not the apostles. The apostles stayed behind in Jerusalem. But verse 4 says, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. They're running for their lives, basically. They're fleeing Jerusalem. They're fleeing their homes because Saul is going around killing Christians, burning their homes, confiscating their goods. So these people are running from the authorities on purpose, with good reason. They are running from the authorities, broke, destitute, not knowing where they're going to go, where they're going to live, how they're going to make a living, basically. If we could put ourselves in that circumstance. And, and yet, what are they doing while they're on the run. What are they doing? They're telling people about Jesus. Now why would you do that? You're just gonna get them in trouble. <laughs> you know, you tell them about Jesus, now they're gonna have to go on the run. Somebody's gonna come after them in their house, their goods, the things that they own. It's gonna mess up their family. Is Jesus really worth that? Is he worth being on the run? Is he worth hiding from the Authorities? Is he worth losing all that you have? The bottom line is they said yes. Yes, he is. And not only did they believe it for themselves, they believed it was worth telling others about it because they understood who Jesus is. 
And evangelism, the nat natural evangelism that takes place is a result simply of understanding who Jesus is. That's how evangelism should take place and why it should take place. We, we follow Jesus. We learn about Jesus. We begin to understand who Jesus is. We get excited about Jesus because we know who He is. And we tell others about Jesus. And we understand. We understand more about Jesus than they did. Now by the time we get to Acts, they understood the, the suffering Savior. They understood that this, the Messiah came not just to free them from political oppression, which he would do in the future. Obviously, they weren't free from political oppression at this point in time. But now they understood that he came to save them from their sins. He came to forgive. He came to give them a new life in heaven that starts here on earth and they were excited about that and even while they were on the run fleeing for their lives because of that person of Jesus they were telling others about the person of Jesus are we as excited about Jesus as John was as Andrew was as Philip was as Nathaniel was when we understand what he's done for us, we get excited. And we tell people about who Jesus was. That's what's happening here. Verse 47 says, When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus asked, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now this is the only indication in this particular gospel account where we see Jesus doing something that might have been miraculous. It wasn't a miracle because the Bible says the turning of wine was the first, but it was a display of his omniscience. It was a, it was a display of some of the, the, the qualities that Christ possessed, but it wasn't actually considered a miracle because the Bible says the first miracle is the, the turning of the wine. But then it says, Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the king, and there's that idea of political leader, uh, uh, political messiah, you are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In other words, you're going to see far greater things than what you've seen, Nathaniel, today. And we, are, we have seen those greater things as we look into the Scriptures and as we see the entire life of Christ portrayed before our very eyes. Are you excited about that? Are you excited about Jesus? Are you telling others about Jesus? Are you willing to risk everything to follow Jesus? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we see in, in the, the New Testament very ordinary people leaving their jobs, and leaving their families at times, not permanently, but encountering hardship and difficulty in many different ways, in many different forms, in many different fashions, no doubt, to, to follow Jesus. And in the process, they don't become disillusioned or dissatisfied with Jesus, but instead they become excited and they tell others about him. And then they tell still more, and they tell still more. And we see the explosive growth of the early church because people were excited about knowing who Jesus was. And Father, I, I fear that today we've grown so used to who Jesus is, we're no longer excited about him. We're so accustomed to who he is that it doesn't thrill our soul anymore. We know we're forgiven. We know we have a home in heaven, but even that has become mundane. So, Father, I pray that you would rekindle within us that excitement that, that we see in, in these early disciples and that we had in our early years where we were excited about finding the Messiah, where we wanted others to know him, where we went out and told people, come, we have found the Messiah. Father, just help us to have that, that fire within us again, that excitement within us again. Help us 
to bring others to Jesus. I ask this in his precious name. Amen.